Hello and welcome to Quartic Training. Corporate Finance Study Sessions 8 and 9. In this section, we start with a little bit of revision from Level 1, but very rapidly go into much more involved analysis. We've got 5 to 15 percent of the exam. 5 to 15 percent is Corporate Finance. So quite likely you will get one or two questions. So be prepared for anything from all five of these chapters are thoroughly examinable. We look initially at capital budgeting, so considering sort of net present value and IRR that you're hopefully very familiar with, but extending it, looking at sort of tax considerations, looking at various other concepts within that, all sorts of different things. Capital structure, we introduce, we introduce the idea of Modigliani and Miller, a couple of their propositions, what happens with uh, debt to equity, and in particular as we introduce tax. Uh, lots of different concepts, lots of things relating to capital structure and how companies operate and how the capital structure uh, affects valuation in different ways. We then go into dividends and share repurchases. We did a bit of this chapter at level one, so we look at uh, dividend policy, how companies choose what dividends to pay, a little bit about tax on that, and then effectively just look at how different people may choose different types of companies depending on the dividend. Corporate governance then extends, we've already looked at that at level one, but we look at this in a bit more detail. In particular, the difference between the conflicts that appear between shareholders and directors and those between shareholders and managers. Directors being those who make the decisions, managers being those who implement them. And then finally, mergers and acquisitions, reading 32. Uh, quite a detailed chapter there, looking at some of the issues, lots of definitions of what mergers are, uh, what, the, uh, what the motivations are, uh, how, we, how companies defend against them, um, various concentration indices like Herfindel Hirschman uh, that you should already have seen at level one, some comments on valuation methods, so that's mostly leading towards what we do in equity. Um, and looking at who benefits and who loses out when a bid takes place. So that is the outline. We're going to begin study session 8 with reading 28, which is capital budgeting. So we start with a review of five methods that we saw at um, level 1. We then look at cash flow projections, so extending the level 1 concepts. Uh, we look at a depreciation, a tax depreciation mechanism called MACAS. Uh, we look at replacement versus expansion projects. Um, we look at the choice between two projects uh, with unequal lives, two methods of doing that. Looking at different risk analysis, discount rates, real options, various pitfalls, uh, and then the idea of accounting versus economic income, which you've seen before, and other valuation models as well, which uh, we'll give a hint through to what's to come when we do equity. To start off, so just a warm-up, first of all, just a bit of a revision. Uh, you'll see actually in the curriculum that we get, it goes through all of this. It's all optional readings, but uh, what it's saying is you do need to be familiar with all the concepts from level one. So we are capital budgeting. We are looking at making decisions on how to, how to put a limited budget into certain projects. Um, we're looking at cash flow analysis rather than earnings analysis. So cash flows are more important. The timing is essential because we're going to be using discounting techniques. We need to include opportunity costs. So we need a cost would be lost revenue from another project we could have done. It's got to be after tax, something we tended to ignore at level one, but we're going to be doing that in more depth in this session, and we ignore financing costs, things like dividends and interest payments, because, because that's part of the discounting process. So things like dividends, we don't pay, we don't consider dividends as a cash flow, because dividends are effectively just part of the discounting, it's part of the rate of return to the investors. The basic idea for how we look at cash flows in case you're a little bit rusty on this, is the idea, is the relevant cash flow we're looking at is the cash flow with the project minus the cash flow without the project. In other words, we're looking at the incremental cash flows. If we have, let's say, if the project generates $100,000 of revenues, uh, cash revenues, whereas without the project we would have achieved $60,000 of revenues, then the incremental cash flow is just the 40. So it's cash flow with, which is 100,000, minus cash flow without, which is 60,000, giving us an incremental cash flow of 40. 
A sunk cost is a cost that either has already been paid or has already been committed. So we are going to be using a machine that is already sitting there or we have already committed to buying a machine and doing the project will not make a difference. So in that case, it doesn't cause any incremental cash flow. Cash flow with and cash flow without is the same and therefore the difference between the two is zero. An externality, this is some outside impact. It could well be that by doing one project, another project loses value, and therefore that would be a cost to this project. Uh, and replacement versus expansion, we're going to be looking at that in more depth later. But if you are replacing a project, then the incremental nature of our analysis is essential. Cash flows with this project versus cash flows with the previous project will give us the increment. Whereas if we look at expansion, cash flows without the project, we presume are zero. And so we're only looking at cash flows with the project as being incremental. Having done the cash flow analysis using that uh, basic idea from start to finish, uh, we then use the methods that we saw uh, at level one, which is net present value, internal rate of return, payback, discounted payback, and profitability index. Let us begin with an example. Here is a net present value calculation. You should be pretty familiar with how this works on the calculator. So doing the basic net present value, what we have here is a project with 50 outflow at the start, a series of 16s coming in, and then 20 at the end. Now we should be uh, pretty comfortable doing this on the machine. Let's um, have a look and see how it goes. We press the CF button, press second clear work to get to clear out the memory. Uh, we are investing 50 initially, so put that in as so plus minus, put that in as CF0, scroll down. CO1 is 16, enter that. F is the frequency of the 16, we actually have four of them, so let's enter four there. And then the next cash flow is 20, enter and we're done we've entered it if you want you can check the fo2 is one but that's all we that that's all we need uh, if we now press net present value type in the discount rate which we're told is 10 percent scroll down press npv compute npv that gives us 13 just over 13 in other words it is positive therefore we invest i mean that's all uh, that's very much all revision. So as you know, with net present value, uh, we have a positive, if you have a positive NPV, then you're going to invest. If you have a negative NPV, then you're not going to invest. Internal rate of return. If we want to find the IRR of those cash flows, it's pretty simple. You press IRR, compute. Wait a second, and there's your answer, 19.5%. So that's how we calculate the IRR, and the rule with IRR is if the IRR is greater than our cost of capital, let's say the weighted average cost of capital, or WAC, then we're going to invest. So if the IRR exceeds our required rate of return, we invest. If it's less than, we don't invest. However, please remember that the IRR is not infallible and it assumes we have got a normal project with cash out followed by cash in. So normal cash flows. That is an essential assumption. For example, if we imagine a project, so here's our 50, just sketching this project for a second. Uh, we had one, two, three, four, then slightly bigger one at the end. Uh, that has an IRR of 19.5%. Let's say we were to reverse the project, so we get in a certain amount of money and then we have to pay out those cash flows, the IRR is going to be exactly the same because at 19.5% discount rate, the NPV of both of those projects is zero. And therefore, you can see that if the NPV of the first one uh, is plus 13, the NPV of the second one is minus 13. And clearly, the first project is a good investment. The second project is not, even though they both have the same IRR. And therefore, where we have a conflict, the net present value gives us a more useful measure.